Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ECLG and CIB conversation on development cooperation. I see many of you have now joined the room. Welcome. This conversation will be uh, in English, uh, but there is also French interpretation. So feel free to join us in French or to share your thoughts in French. Um, I believe by now most people know how to use interpretation in Zoom. If you have issues, please let us know in the chat. Um, I see many participants from different countries in Africa. It's really nice to have you here. Also some participants from the UCLG World Secretariat, welcome. Uh, and as you saw, the meeting is being recorded, but only for uh, note taking uh, uh, and, and, and for, well, including these comments in, in the work that we do. Um, so, so thank you for that, for accepting that. Um, I am here to moderate today's conversation. My name is Jesse Post. I uh, work at VNG International, the international agency of the Association of Dutch Municipalities in the Netherlands. But I also run the secretariat of one of the working groups uh, of UCLG. Uh, the Capacity and Institution Building Working Group, which is a, a working group uh, which brings together associations and cities working on development cooperation. Um, it's, a, it's a group of practitioners, uh, a peer community, and also a group that advocates for well, more attention to, to development cooperation within UCLG. It's not a political working group, but we try to connect to the political uh, uh, entities of UCLG, uh, of course. Um, and we work a lot with the UCLG World Secretariat, uh, obviously, and this conversation is a, uh, is a, a joint uh, effort of the UCLG learning team, uh, Fernando Sarah and Maria, and maybe others are also here today, um, and CIB, because we felt that it's important to link learning uh, to policy and vice versa, um, and, and, uh, and also uh, to bring together different parts of the world. But I'll leave the rest of the opening uh, to Sarah Heuflich uh, from the World Secretariat. Um, uh, just before I give the floor to Sarah, I'm going to show you very quickly what the agenda looks like for today. So we have a brief introduction by Sarah. Uh, it says it includes a video message of Emilia, but unfortunately that's a miscommunication on my side. So in fact, Sarah is going to, uh, 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 brief us on behalf of the World Secretariat, which is great. Um, then we talk about the regional perspective on development cooperation, and today that's the African perspective. Um, so thank you also UCLG Africa for bringing your members to this uh, conversation. Um, followed by a presentation of our draft policy paper on development cooperation by Sebastien Hamel, a consultant uh, who has previous experience with CIB and who is with us today from Canada, followed by maybe the most important part, an open discussion on the content of this policy paper and the calls for action mentioned in it um, with you to hear whether they are relevant for you, whether we are missing things, um, yeah, and, and to make sure that the African perspective is also included correctly. And then I will end with some next steps um, for this work. We have one hour, so I'm quickly going to move to uh, Sarah. Oh, and I suddenly am <laughs> all white. <laughs> Here I am again. Uh, so I give the floor to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse, and thank all of you coming uh, here for this dialogue. That is very, very important for us. So first, I would like to is, um, bring also the welcome on behalf of our Secretary General, Emilia, and the policy team. They, they really send apologies. They are in New York to feedback on the new urban agenda as a lever to achieve the sustainable development goals, the SDG. 
So as you see, we don't miss any opportunity to highlight the role and commitment of local and regional government to the global agenda. And also it's in this line that UCLG's vision uh, is that decentralized cooperation is fully recognized and well-funded, complementary to other development corporations, and it is crucial to achieve the global goals and leave no one and no place behind, as we always say. <laughs> so to get there, it's a long way that builds on numerous milestones globally and regionally and requires a solid policy and advocacy strategy to rely on. As UCLG and the Global Task Force are considered the voice of local governments in global bodies, we have an important mandate to do so. So in the global decisions, sometimes we are invited as members, sometimes as observers, but we always try to be there in the gatherings of, uh, for example, the Global Alliance for Partnership, the United Nations, ECOSOC and others, also in regional, uh, the, for example, the European Policy Forum on Development, the PDF. And there are many, numerous, many, many opportunities in the African continent that are carried out by our, our regional sections, in this case, UCLGA. So in order to make all this meaningful over time, sometimes uh, advocacy can take a decade, the strategy fee, uh, needs clear finding messages and true perspective of our members and to be built bottom up. And that's why we are here today and are very happy to uh, con have this conversation with you. So UCLG, we have mandated the CIB to renew their policy paper on development cooperation that was done in 2013. As this paper resulted extremely helpful in the advocacy process and also in clarification of terms and specificities of decentralized cooperation. I recommend, even if it's now almost 10 years old, but I recommend this paper, it's a real milestone. Since the paper was edited, the cooperation landscape has changed. And the main change I would like to recall for, so the first change is the narrative. The SDG agenda is of, from uh, 2015 and it enables all actor, actors to better express and align their development progress, in particular the uh, SDG 17. The funding, uh, the global goals are not any longer a North-South North funding agreement as it was uh, uh, with the Millennium Development Goals, but it opened up to mobilize more actors everywhere. And consequently, we have less funding distributed to more actors, but also new ways of funding coming up. The third point would be modalities. So in the last year, uh, the last year was marked by the COVID pandemic and the cooperation mechanisms have changed and the classical project formats as well are uh, overseen and renewed uh, in, the, uh, um, in the regions. And force and uh, is a change in roles. And this is thanks to stronger and better capacitated and informed local actors and governments. For example, also relations between the NGO sectors and local government, between national and local government, between networks and local government. So we have a lot of new networks coming up to support uh, local and regional government sometimes even overlapping in their functions, <clears throat> but at least uh, coming up to also make, uh, make, play a role in the, in the new cooperation landscape. So last but not least, I would like, of course, to also talk on my behalf. I'm Sarah Höflich and I'm the Director of Learning. And together with Platforma, we have been developing and implementing uh, a module, uh, the module four, which deals on decentralized cooperation and SDG. So through trainings of trainers, this module four has helped uh, building on this new perspective because it is very clear that we need a stronger and capacitated local and regional government in all region to drive their own development processes. These trainings have been coordinated by our sections and the first training uh, was developed and implemented by UCLG Africa. So in our two TOTs, as we call it, and we did two TOTs in Africa, one English speaking and one French speaking, it was surprising. We found so much expertise 
so much project and in particular South South and Triangular Corporation, as well as new donors like the Moroccan Fund or the African Development Banks. So years ago, we had implemented a project for South South Triangular Corporation. Maybe some of you remember this. It was between 15 Mozambican and Brazilian cities that embedded on many, many existing partnerships and also built new partnerships that are still in existing today. So by that time, this is now 10 years ago, we met with Fernando and Sogen, who together with Charles, Maria Alejandra and Nayat are keys to the conception of our module four and the rollout. I'm very happy that, that you are today with us and uh, we all will have the opportunity to share lessons learned and reflect and input on the policy paper uh, of the CIB that will be the basis for UCLG for our advocacy in the years to come. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm now looking forward to the discussions. Back to Jesse. Thank you, Sarah, for this great framing of all the work which has been happening uh, well, in the past decade, <laughs> actually, and also in the past uh, months. And very glad um, that we are well doing this together. Um, and as I said before, linking learning to policy, because it seems like a missed opportunity if we don't. Um, and the learning uh, activities that the module four has yielded very interesting regional papers. Um, and I believe Sogen will now share some inputs from the African paper. So I'm very interested to learn more. I hope the others, I think the others are too. So I give the floor to Sogen. You are on mute, so then, so we cannot hear you yet. Ah, yes. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. And it's legible. Everyone can see the screen, right? Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, geez, Sarah, 10 years. That's, uh, they say time flies when you're having fun. So I think a lot has happened over the last 10 years. So it's really um, an honor and privilege for me to be able to uh, share some reflections. Um, um, as Sarah outlined the process that we've uh, been involved in last year in UCLG Africa. And I've been quite um, privileged, as I mentioned, to support the team um, and Charles and I had a quick chat and he asked me to, uh, to, to lead the presentation and during the discussions he'll be sharing some of his thoughts. Um, so um, just to start off before talking about the, the training of trainers, I think it's very useful um, to set the scene, right? And when we're looking at the African development uh, context, there's a couple of things that's really important to help us frame even this conversation. And the first obviously is massive population growth and uh, very high levels of urbanization on the continent. And what does this mean for city to city learning for decentralized cooperation? It really means there's a pressure for cities to be able to catalyze particularly innovations in, in practice. So I think that's happening on the one hand. And um, secondly, um, as I'll talk just now around um, the African Agenda 2063, there's always this thrust around how are cities thinking, not just about Agenda uh, uh, 2030, but 2063. And thinking particularly as we learn from each other and uh, in a decentralized cooperation frame, how it is that we are constantly changing our economic policies in order to attract much needed investment. So in, a, in terms of the bigger African development context, that kind of sets the scene. Um, and the third aspect there, it's always about improving democratic governance, trying to improve service delivery, ensuring that there's civic participation um, as well as respect for human rights. So that's the bigger kind of African development context. At the same time, what does this mean for cities, right? Cities and uh, local regional governments. So the Accord Development Consultancy put together a very nice kind of summary of looking at African cities and uh, I highlighted five key challenges that I think are very important. And when we having conversation around decentralized cooperation, these must be reflected on and having an understanding 
from a needs-based perspective is very important to help frame a conversation. So very quickly, the first is around cities and uh, uh, local and regional governments not having enough of um, strategic and long-term planning, right? That's the first major issue, very, very much of a limited enabling policy and legislation. Secondly, we're finding antiquated systems and procedures, right? And we unpack that in terms of finance and procurement and decision-making. Thirdly, obviously, severe issues around resources, whether it's lack of skills, as I mentioned, the systems, limited own resources. Fourthly, service delivery, major service delivery challenges around economy, social, the environment. And um, the fifth area is around governance. This is to do with not enough uh, leadership, areas around um, opportunities for more engagement, for more collaboration, for more communication, and for more active leadership. So on the continent, and we realize it's a huge continent, right? If we have to summarize the five key things um, that really have an impact for municipalities, it would be this. So I thought I'd just spend a minute there uh, summarizing the development context. When we started the process in UCLG Africa, and this is really important, we felt it's important to use decentralized cooperation as an enabler for one, the SDGs, as well as an enabler for this agenda 2063. So it's, it's not happening in isolation, right? This, this is a really important point. We're using it as a catalyst, we're using it as a driver to make the SDG localization process happen and to achieve the vision of agenda 2063. More importantly, out of our strategic workshop that we held after the training, we felt that our SDG linked uh, DC program must be focused in particular on South-South and triangular technical cooperation. As Sarah said, over the last 10 years, many African cities and local regional governments have come a long way actually embedding uh, a triangular technical cooperation. So that in essence is our kind of strategic approach. So without spending too much of time on the details of the actual training module, um, we do want to say this is relevant for the CIB working group. The entire process was around how do you build intensive technical capacity where you empower practitioners and to an extent some uh, politicians at the local level to lead this SDG linked cooperation. And we found that um, this added an immense amount of uh, value because it was not abstract, it was not theoretical, it was not academic. The training used real life case studies. So we spent many months working with Charles and the team identifying real case studies. And secondly, empowering practitioners themselves to present and lead the training so that they could prepare for action on the ground, right? So I thought that was also an important point to share. Um, how did it all go very quickly? Um, you'll see on the slide there, uh, more than half of participants um, in our quick survey poll rated it as, as excellent. They found it energizing and motivating. They ended up being knowledgeable and inspired. They were energized, et cetera, right? Uh, these slides are available and the detailed results are also available. More importantly, we use the training opportunity to sit with UCLG Africa, Charles and the team to be able to come up with a coherent plan of action to kind of guide action that's much more sustained on the continent. So it was a process of how do we roll out training, one. Two, how do we establish a monitoring and evaluation framework, right? And we'll talk later about what this more, the six recommendations for the policy paper, right? Because we, as we professionalizing uh, practitioners, we don't necessarily have systems and frameworks in place of monitoring, for example. Thirdly, how do we come up with simplified methods for accessing technical cooperation? We're talking about becoming professionalizing, uh, uh, becoming professionals, but are there methods that are able to help us in a very simple way access this technical uh, cooperation? And the fourth point which came up uh, uh, strongly from leadership was that we're not doing enough to celebrate South-South and Triangular cooperation, even though we know it, and I think Charles was advocating for this, he was saying we need to go back to political leaders and say, this is something we believe in, this is something that we all must focus on, right? And the bottom of the slide um, that came out during the workshop was that it must, our entire SDG-linked program must be needs-based. We must have a good sense 
of what the needs are on the continent in the east of the continent, the west and the south, and respond based on real needs, right? Um, the fifth point I want to make is that what is the lever, right? And I'm kind of reiterating, reiterating this point. It's about building urgent capacity and building support from where? Is it from UCLG? Is it from UCLGA? No, it's actually to flip it around and to build capacity and support from below, as Sarah mentioned, a bottom up approach. To start from the municipal levels, we're finding that as we interacted with cities, not all of the cities have uh, knowledge management embedded. They don't have institutional structures to push knowledge management, right? So we start at a city level. They, we then work with mobilizing local government associations to champion this SDG uh, linked uh, uh, cooperation and for them to support local and regional governments. And then to re-energize the regions, what we're calling Waro, Saro, and Yaro, these are, the, these are the geographic regions, to then help to reactivate DC. So the, the suggestion is, how do you flip this on, on its head, right? Whilst UCLG is playing a critical role in terms of policy and coordination, how do you turn this apex role around so that it's very much bottom up? And I thought that was very important in terms of our approach to build this urgent capacity. Um, and during the workshop, we came up with a, a, a couple of key things, a detailed plan of action, and this is available. I, I won't waste our time on what those steps are. Um, but also UCLG Africa was going to really follow up, working with all of the participants and supporting regions, right? This is the important point. As a, a regional section to support regions to actually initiate it, um, that we felt was very important. Um, and to do this was we were going to kind of organize a separate three regional trainings over 2021, 2022 in Southern, Eastern and West Africa. And essentially to continue monitoring and evaluation and, and evaluating to ensure that the momentum that we started with the French and, and um, English training to ensure that this momentum continues. So um, I'll skip this slide, Jesse, because this is kind of reflecting on having looked at the CIB paper and crystallized what does this mean? I think we'll keep this for, uh, for, the, for the discussion later. Um, but in essence, I think we, we, it definitely resonates the thinking from uh, um, from our training program definitely resonates with the thinking of the policy paper. So I'll stop there and I hope that was a useful summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sogan. And I believe, uh, would, shall I now give the floor to Charles for additions or for, since you mentioned Sogan that you will do this together? Um, I think Charles was wanting to engage in, in our deliberations and our discussion okay. session. Yes. Okay, no problem. Is it okay for you, Charles, to come in later at the dialogue? So again, has presented quite a conference. Okay, uh, your connection is a bit unstable, so I hope that's in the next part uh, we are able to further connect. Um, uh, for now, uh, thank you very much, uh, so again, for, for your uh, quick and, and efficient summary of what all the work you've been doing with the African section of UCLG. I think it's very important what you mentioned that uh, any DC response must be needs based, data driven, data driven, and respond within its context. I think that's, that's essential uh, in, in, in development cooperation and in decentralized cooperation. And it's interesting that you connect DC, or well, that you mentioned that the uh, decentralized cooperation is not only an enabler for the SDGs, but also for the African Union's agenda of 2063. I don't think we explicitly make uh, a mention of these uh, regional agendas, but um, if we don't for the moment, then uh, we should, I think. Um, and last but not least, I liked what you mentioned about the plan of action with UCLG Africa. Uh, I think we agree that, it, that that's, this should be driven from the bottom up, but we can still at the level of networks facilitate uh, local governments. Uh, so both at CIB, UCLG level, but also at the regional section level. 
And we do need to connect, I believe, as CIB working group to such plans of action um, and, and will do so uh, in the future. Uh, I can commit to that uh, already. Um, without further ado, I would now like to give the floor to uh, Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Amel, who we've uh, hired to work on the policy paper uh, well, for the past months uh, already, uh, many consultations, many interviews, uh, and we now have a draft set of uh, calls for action. So I'd like to give Sebastian the chance to present these, and then we'll open the floor to everyone else in the call. Sebastian. Thank you, <clears throat> Jesse. Um, and thank you also, uh, Sarah and Fernando, to uh, bring all of us uh, together uh, today. Uh, as uh, Jesse was just mentioning, I was hired to to help, you know, like uh, draft the uh, the new version of uh, that policy paper. And as uh, Sarah was mentioning, the uh, the, the previous version uh, dates uh, 2013. I was involved at the time. I was uh, part of uh, the the CIB. Um, so it's it's good to be here today. Um, I've done a lot of reading, I've done uh, some interviews, I've uh, checked, you know, like uh, some of the work that you've done in the region, but it's always great to, uh, to be uh, in a group like this and, and to hear from you and, and to discuss. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to that discussion. Um, my role now is really to introduce to you the sort of the six main uh, areas of recommendations that we've come uh, with so far. Uh, the idea is really to take half of uh, this, this meeting to uh, really discuss them and to enrich them and to, to get, you know, your specific and concrete uh, recommendations on what we should be uh, putting into that uh, policy document. So I won't take too much time to go through uh, the six that we have so far. You've received a document uh, late last week. Uh, which is a four or five pager that you know, like gives you a little bit the gist of, uh, of these recommendations. What I want to say is that imagine the policy statement that will come to the UCLG Executive Bureau in June. This is a sort of the end of the document. This is the sort of the, the, the recommendation that will come after we've talked about the, uh, the context, we've talked about the evolution of uh, decentralized cooperation over the years. It was very interesting, um, Sarah, and, and so again, that you presented a little bit of that context because these are the kind of uh, information we'll put in the, the first part of, uh, of the document. Um, so I have like a, a, a few slides just to guide us through um, these six uh, areas of recommendation, but I'm also making reference to the document that uh, you received uh, last uh, last week. So maybe Jesse, you can go to the first uh, first slide. Is it me or you who has control? I think it's you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have control, but I, I am seeing my slides, but apparently you are. Okay. Okay, so th this slide, obviously, you know, we've talked about this, the need to, uh, to really come with a call to action to make decentralized cooperation better recognized. And, and this is really, as Sarah was mentioning at the start, anchored in a vision uh, that UCLG has, that decentralized cooperation is really uh, a sort of fully recognized, efficient, professional, impactful, uh, and well-funded development cooperation modality that is responding to the most pressing development challenges that we face as local and regional government and also local uh, government associations. Um, so when we have a vision that uh, a modality like decentralized cooperation should be you know, recognized and so on and so on, the next step is what do we need? What do we need to make it uh, recognized? What do we need to make it more efficient? What do we need to make it even better than what it, uh, it was so far? So this is what this call to, uh, to action is about. So in reading um, all the interviews that were done in the last year, reading material that came uh, from the work on module four, um, I tried to capture everything that people were saying that we must do into a number of areas. So that was not necessarily easy because, you know, like it's different, you know, from one region to the other. Uh, some people would say we need to focus on this because this is the most important one. Others, you know, will have a different uh, opinion. Uh, so this is so far, you know, like what we, uh, we've been able to try to summarize and to capture some of that. 
So the first one, the first call to action is, is actually, uh, you could say an obvious one for all of us is to push um, for what we see a continuous recognition of the role of local and regional government in addressing uh, global challenges. So we don't need ourselves to be convinced that local government matters, but this notion that local government is a very important order of government that can and should be helping address you know, the challenges that we face in this world from uh, climate change to uh, poverty reduction, to peace and so on and so on, uh, is not always seen as obvious by everybody. So as someone was telling me in one of the interviews, we need to continuously push the pedal to the metal. <laughs> so that's an expression that says, let's go and always push on this to make sure that people actually recognize that local and regional government matter and that they need to be supported to be able to address these issues. Sogan said it very um, uh, nicely, you know, in the context of Africa, when you see urbanization growth, you know, with these, these digits and these numbers going so, so high, it's obvious that local governments are the solutions to the development challenges that are being faced in, in, in Africa. And this needs to be recognized everywhere in the world. So the first call to action is to actually continue to do the good work that we've been doing for the past 10, 15 years in making the case for why local government matters. And what you've seen in, in the document that was uh, sent last week is that this means you know, to continue to speak with one voice at the global level, obviously UCLG, but the GTF is also a very important you know, partner to do this. Uh, continue to ask for formal seats at the regional level, the global level, also at the national level, uh, push our national government to have more decentralized uh, policies and programs, uh, also push the multilateral and bilateral funders to ensure that decentralization local governance remains thematic focuses. That's not always the case. You know, we've seen, for instance, in Europe that decentralization and local governance was a big you know, thematic focus in the past uh, few years, but then there's a new development agenda where it's more thematic and governance is maybe less present. So all this to say that we need first to continue to push to make sure that local government matters and that people recognize the essential role that we play in addressing development issues. So this is not a new call to action, but this is it's one that we need to continue. So that's one. The second is, okay, so if local government matters, well, then decentralized cooperation as a development modality is also something that is uh, needs to be fully recognized. Um, so again, it's the same thing. The centralized cooperation in, in recent years has attracted more attention from multilateral and bilateral donors. So this is good. We're, we're seeing as development partners more and more, but yet it's not fully achieved. We haven't won the battle yet, you know, and we need to ensure that we are uh, the decentralized cooperation is recognized as a very essential and central development modality. Um, some, you know, like always will still see uh, local government doing decentralized cooperation as one of the non-state development partner. It's very sometimes complicated to compete with others to have access to resources to do decentralized cooperation. So there's a number of issues there. And that's why the second call is to continue to promote decentralized cooperation as an essential development co cooperation modality. And if you look at the document with some of the more concrete actions that we're proposing is to push for that recognition in some countries to ensure that the legis legislative frameworks will facilitate local government doing development cooperation because it's not always the case everywhere. Uh, the importance of developing what we call strategic partnerships with national governments. Some countries are moving in that direction where their national government has very concrete you know, agreements with the local government authorities in how local government authorities can be involved in decentralized cooperation. The financing, Sarah mentioned it as being one of the issue, obviously. Uh, there's more actors involved in decentralized cooperation, no more funding, so we're spreading the resources thin. We always have to fight to have you know, local uh, financing over the long term, so this is a, an important issue as well. So a number of things we need to do. The third one is more like a call to action to ourselves. You know? We need to continue to make decentralized cooperation more effective, professional. Uh, again, so again mentioned, you know, the need to have strong monitoring and evaluation systems. 
There's a number of things there that we need to do ourselves to make our own development cooperation more effective. We need to focus on the most important issues, climate change, you know, poverty reduction. We need to focus also where urbanization is at its greatest, you know, because this is where the issues uh, are, are happening. Um, we need also to, that's something that came very strongly in, in some of your regional work, the, the role of national association and regional association to coordinate, to bring all these actors and partners a little bit more together because we're, we're sometimes being seen as being very fragmented in the way that we do the centralized cooperation. So that's something we need to do to also ourselves coordinate better, align better, harmonize better what we do, uh, and so on. Um, you mentioned, uh, so again, the, the emerging uh, new models of decentralized cooperation, South-South and Triangular. We also need to ensure that you know, these models are fully developed because in many instances, they are way more relevant than the usual models that we knew, North, South, and so on and so on. So this needs also to be something that to improve our game and our practice of decentralized cooperation, we need to invest in these emerging new models. Um, data, information, monitoring, evaluation, you know, like this is, I was talking with someone from the World Bank and, and the person was saying, we don't even know what is the impact of decentralized cooperation properly uh, in terms of fun, uh, financing flows and number of initiatives. So we need ourselves to invest in something like this. So the third one is really a call to action to ourselves to make our practice better and more efficient, anchored into strong data, monitoring, evaluation, as we will improve our game, we will be doing better work, and we will also be better recognized by other players. The fourth one is maybe something that's evolved, you know, in the last um, five, six, seven years. Um, traditionally, you know, decentralized cooperation was really technical assistance, you know, knowledge sharing, and so on and so on. But obviously, local government to be able to do their job, they need financing. They need their own resources. They need more stable fiscal transfers and they need to access the new financial markets that are becoming to be open to local government more and more. So the fourth one is, and, and we've done great work, you know, especially with FMDV, but also ASD, ACDF in Africa, in getting involved in that sphere, that financing sphere a little bit more. And decentralized cooperation could be, you know, going into that sphere even more by, you know, like focusing our projects on issues related to fiscal autonomy of local governments, on fiscal transfers. We have a lot of experience, you know, a lot of lessons that we should share. So the fourth call to action is let's engage that sphere more with decentralized cooperation and put in place practices, examples, exchanges between ourselves that would focus on accessing these new financial markets, but also on, on strengthening the capacity of local government to have fiscal autonomy. The fifth one, Maybe next slide, uh, um, Jesse, if you can. The fifth one is um, like the, the, the context has changed in the last 10 years where, you know, there's, it's way more complex, um, a complex context in terms of relationships between countries. New countries are emerging in the field of development cooperation. Uh, let's talk about China, you know, South Africa, you know, Russia, and so on and so on. So there's new players. Um, and then there's many other organizations, as Sarah was mentioning, many new networks that are also emerging. And everybody is involved one way or the other into the local governance sphere. So that complexity of new uh, partners make it more challenging to coordinate, to ensure that we align, to ensure that we're efficient, to ensure that we know who's doing what. And we local government and the local government movement can have a role to play to help bring a little bit more coordination. Among ourselves, you know, like by the relationships that we have between local governments in all countries, we can contribute to bring a little bit more coordination in that new world of development cooperation that is, uh, that is emerging. So the fifth call is to give ourselves the mandate to try to bring a little bit more coordination in that more complex setting. Um, that means, you know, like to continue to create these alliances with civil society organization, academic institutions, the private sector, something that we've done more and more in the last decade. I think the centralized cooperation has become way more diverse and complex, also in terms of its relationships, you know, that we've developed to implement it. Um, so we should continue that. Um, we should engage 
continue to engage into this forum where these multi-stakeholders are being involved. We should also create venues for, for local governments between the new countries, you know, like the, the, the China of this world, the South Africa, you know, like the Russia, to coordinate also better, you know, with the other countries that are involved in decentralized cooperation. So that's the fifth one. And I'll stop with the sixth one, which is a little bit uh, also decentralized cooperation has always been a way to engage our citizens as well, you know, like in, in world affairs or international affairs. Many people that um, I interviewed were, were telling me there's a little bit of a setback here, you know, like because of the pandemic, because of COVID-19, we tend sometimes as countries to turn inward, you know, and focus on issues at home, you know, like and less, you know, issues of international nature. So there's a little bit of reflux, a reflux, you know, in the sort of the public support to the role of local government doing international work. And we need to acknowledge this and we need to give ourselves maybe a call to action to try to bring back the citizens, you know. And that means awareness building, that means informing them of what we do, but it means of more importantly to engage them because it's when the public and the citizens are engaged into our activities that they develop, you know, this vision of the world and they, they want to do more and that they are more supportive. So six, you know, calls to uh, to action under each, you know, some some suggested concrete ways of advancing these six ones. But obviously, today is to get, you know, your your uh, your viewpoint on this and, and to enrich these uh, six areas and the actions on Berka. So I'll stop because I've taken already, you know, more than ten minutes. Thank you, Sebastian. No, and I think in, uh, actually you've, you've uh, it was a rather concise presentation of all the work you have been doing uh, together with CIB members uh, over the past uh, months uh, and CIB members already also last year. Um, you also prepared three questions for today's um, discussion with members from UCLG Africa, which are now on the screen. Um, the first is, do the six suggested main calls for action reflect challenges and opportunities in the field of decentralized cooperation in your region? So what we've been talking about before. So let's try to bring together the findings from, uh, from well, the learning activities and the, 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 the training of trainers on module four and the recommendations and, and calls for action from, from CIB. Perhaps there are others that need to be added. Um, secondly, what other specific measures should we add under each of the six calls to action to make these more concrete and supportive to your work? And lastly, do you have any other recommendations which should enter into the policy statement? Um, so the next 50 minutes will be mostly, uh, well, an open discussion with you. And I see that uh, dear friend Najat has already raised her hand and so has Segla from Benin. Um, Najat was first, I believe, so I'm going to give the floor to Najat uh, to kick off the, the dialogue. Najat. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, good evening or good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, really uh, congratulate you for this initiative, which is building on a sound experience we had uh, last year with the uh, SARA team and with ALGA team and with the support also of the Special Advisor for Decentralized Cooperation in UCLG Africa. So uh, for me, one suggestion and uh, uh, maybe we need more time to uh, disseminate this uh, excellent uh, presentation made by Sebastian to all our uh, members to uh, gather feedback from them. Uh, they need time based on their uh, own experience, own uh, uh, national context, so that we gather all this uh, element and we can uh, feed uh, this uh, call for uh, action. Uh, the other suggestion I have is about the title. Since we are linking decentralized cooperation with SDGs, can we suggest that uh, we talk about sustainable development cooperation for local government? So this will make the uh, uh, link between SDGs, localizing SDGs and decentralized cooperation. Three main uh, levels, and we will uh, uh, complete later. We need the time. You know that we are preparing a free cities summit. And uh, my apologies, this is why the mobilization was not done as we used to do. But next time it will be much better. 
We are far from uh, US, uh, Afri cities, just uh, three weeks. So we ask for your understanding this time. Uh, the first one is we need to see uh, the centralized cooperation as a policy. Uh, and it's based on each national uh, context. Uh, what are the national arrangements, legal, institutional, in terms of regulation? The second one, how this policy is implemented and localized, which approach we are using. Uh, Sogan talked about uh, top down, but there's also bottom up. A diverse approach that we need to explore. And the third one is how the existence or not of an enabler environment for decentralized cooperation. In terms, not only training of trainers, we need to uh, uh, support and empower the local authorities, the mayors. Sometimes they have no idea about the legal framework of decentralized cooperation. So we need to empower them, to inform them uh, if the legal uh, uh, framework is changed or amended, they need to know it, what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do, because there's regulation and controls uh, uh, on this legal uh, uh, framework. We need also to uh, uh, train the staff and training of trainers is not enough. We need really to, to make sure that we have a staff in each local government dedicated to decentralized cooperation, motivate skills, capacitate, etc. And all what we have addressed during the training of trainers, of course, technical assistance, funding, monitoring, evaluation, reporting, the impact, the capitalization, the narrative, the good practice, the case studies, and uh, finally the networking. Uh, during Afri cities, we are planned with the uh, SHARS to create the first African network of the ma territorial managers of decentralized cooperation. So I can share with you that is very tough to fund data. Since two years, we are working just to identify who is in charge of decentralized cooperation at local or regional level. Sometimes it's the city managers, sometimes it's the cabinet. Uh, it's a diverse perspective. So this is the first window we have tackled is to gather data, and then we will try to meet them at Afri cities. We will create this network and the work will begin. How to empower this staff to understand the challenge uh, arised by Sebastian, to empower them, to prepare them, to make sure that decentralized cooperation, it's not only a matter of traveling, it's a matter of impacting the population and the quality services. And I will end with this, but uh, I uh, pledge in the future, just uh, let us know what is the uh, deadline with the SHARS, we will disseminate largely the documents and gather as much as possible of uh, uh, input and information from our uh, networks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nashat, for this rich uh, comment. Um, I think I will Nijli gives the floor to Segla. Uh, if you're okay with that, Sebastian, perhaps you can react if you want at the end. Is that okay, Sebastian? Okay, so I give the floor to Segla for more input from uh, the African section. Merci, Jessie. En, en français, je pense, non? Bonjour tout le monde. Oui, je parle français. Désolé. Oui. Non, pas de problème. <laughs> Merci. Uh... Merci à tous les présentateurs. Merci à Najat qui vient de me dévancer et qui a pris une partie de mes idées. Je voudrais, euh, quelques éléments de contexte, dire que ici en Afrique francophone, on assiste à une recentralisation. Euh, pendant qu'on insiste pour aller vers plus de décentralisation, nous nous sommes euh, dans un phénomène de recentralisation. Et ça explique aussi les difficultés de la coopération décentralisée. Vous savez, l'un des problèmes que nous avons, et ça, Najat vient de le soulever, c'est des spécialistes de la question de la coopération décentralisée. Il n'y en a pas. Moi, personnellement, mon premier travail de recherche que j'ai fait à l'université, c'était sur la coopération décentralisée. Mais il n'y avait pas un cadre formel pour aller plus loin et donc j'ai abandonné. 
Aujourd'hui, de plus en plus, on en parle, mais j'avoue qu'il n'y a pas de spécialiste. Vous savez, chez nous au Bénin, l'État euh, a décidé à réorganiser la carte diplomatique du pays et a décidé de mettre les diplomates de formation au service des municipalités comme euh, agents de coopération décentralisée. C'est une réforme, mais qui ne satisfait pas pleinement parce qu'ils n'ont pas été formés pour les territoires. Ils ont été formés pour la diplomatie de l'État. Donc, la diplomatie locale euh, euh, n'a toujours pas de, de spécialistes. Ça, c'est le premier point que je fais observer. Le deuxième, c'est que nous manquons véritablement d'éléments euh, de suivi et évaluation. On n'a pas, pas de données, on n'a pas d'informations parce qu'il y a un problème de suivi. Et ça, franchement, je voudrais que dans les discussions, dans les perspectives, que cet aspect-là soit vraiment, euh, euh, retienne l'attention. On n'a pas d'informations. Il y a beaucoup d'actions, beaucoup de choses qui se font, mais euh, difficile à capitaliser, difficile à, à, à identifier. De plus en plus aujourd'hui, euh, des coopérations disparaissent parce que les compétences, ces compétences qui étaient exercées par les communes euh, vont vers des agences ou des structures nationales, des structures gouvernementales. Moi, j'ai assisté malheureusement euh, à la disparition de certaines coopérations qui devraient se mettre en place dans le secteur de l'eau potable et de l'assainissement parce que cette compétence-là euh, n'est plus communale ou en tout cas la commune n'est plus à la maîtrise d'ouvrage et donc Malheureusement, ces coopérations se sont, se sont arrêtées. Donc, voilà quelques éléments de réflexion. Je souhaite véritablement euh, qu'on mette l'accent sur le, le renforcement de capacité, la création de, de est-ce que je vais dire encore, en tout cas, le métier de, de coopération décentralisée, de diplomatie de territoire dans les, dans les communes, dans les régions. Je pense que c'est important euh, que cette réflexion-là se mène et que l'apport de la coopération décentralisée commence à être visible. Des initiatives existent, il faut les organiser, il faut les valoriser, il faut les capitaliser. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Segla. Uh, very interesting to hear your perspective. And I think, uh, in the future... sorry, I'm going to put my translation, switch my translation off, one second. Uh... Yes. Um, no, I wanted to say um, uh, that, is, that is very interesting what you say and that, it, that well, the centralized cooperation also requires uh, speci specified skills uh, and, and that you mentioned that it's uh, yeah, a match. A match, a match. <laughs> um, I would now like to give the floor to Charles Patsika from UCLG Africa. Thank you, thank you. I hope you can hear me now. I was having some uh, connectivity challenges before. Um, just want to add on a few points to what Najat has all already presented. I think she gave a, a, a good sum up of uh, our situation and also how we 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 look at uh, the, the the policy issues. Just a few points. The first one is that. Uh, there is really a strong need to recontextualize a decentralized cooperation to be understood as a development uh, uh, platform, rather than just a, a mere twinning and the collaboration between municipalities. I think we need to make this shift, especially as we try to incorporate uh, the SDGs and the, uh, the Africa Agenda 2063 into the decentralized cooperation um, activities. This is, this is important because in many countries, this is why Najat mentioned that uh, it's difficult to get information because in most of Africa, it is simply understood as a partnership uh, or for twinning and the friendship associations between local governments across, uh, across the globe. So this is one fundamental issue. The second one is that uh, during 2020, we, we took the deliberate decision to strengthen the role of national associations in development cooperation. 
Why? Because uh, we feel that uh, if decentralized cooperation is not linked up to the national association, we will have a fragmentation, which in many cases in Africa, we may not be um, successfully incorporated by central governments. We need, we need a, a, a coordinating framework at the national level. And this coordination is, can only be best provided by the national association. This is why during 2020, in our discussions with the European Com Commission, we strongly emphasized that national associations be involved in the implementation of the, of the European Co new European Cooperation uh, Agreement, uh, the, 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 the national association provides a very important uh, policy synchronization platform at the national level. And also, I think one of the challenges that we have, I'll give you an example. When local governments are allowed to act independently, which we all advocate for, we have a challenge of, of uh, political positions in different areas in a country um, being interfered with from the national perspective. In many cases, we've seen the central governments stop certain collaboration between local governments because they felt that uh, it is becoming political. So it is important to bring in the National Association to provide this national perspective and remove the party political influence, which can easily derail uh, activities at the, at the local level. So I think uh, this is a perspective that I just want to emphasize. I think Najak has covered the key elements that we want to look at, but these are just two elements that I thought I should emphasize. Thank you. Uh, very much, uh, Charles. The CIB working group, group also still works mostly uh, with or consists mostly of people from local government associations for both coordination with national governments, but also coordination of members. So I believe that uh, we are on the same page, uh, definitely, um, that they are a really important uh, actor in development cooperation. Uh, Yusuf Diakitev, the Mali, Servo. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, Jesse. Vous m'entendez? Oui, je vous entends. Vous m'entendez? Oui, ça Pardon. va. Oui, ça va bien. Mais okay. peut-être. Merci bien. Ah oui, ça va. Euh, voilà. D'abord, je remercie les organisateurs pour cette opportunité qui nous permet d'échanger sur ces questions de coopération décentralisée. Euh, moi, mon intervention va porter sur deux points essentiels. Euh, le premier point rejoint un peu euh, l'intervention de, de Patsika, euh, pour ceux qui est même euh, responsable de coopération décentralisée. Et puis le deuxième euh, a trait aux questions sécuritaires euh, que nous nous connaissons au niveau du Sahel et qui est en train malheureusement de s'étendre euh, au pays du littoral et qui impacte négativement sur les actions de coopération décentralisée. D'abord, je crois que euh, Charles Partica a posé le problème. Euh, de plus en plus, euh, la notion de coopération décentralisée doit intégrer euh, les relations que nous entretenons entre... Euh, Organisation de fêtières. Organisation de fêtières. Réunion, il m'invite ça. Vous m'entendez? Il y a quelqu'un en ligne. Voilà. Donc, euh, je disais que euh, les actions de coopération décentralisée, euh, coopération des territoires, diplomatie de proximité, 
etc. devraient intégrer de plus en plus les relations que nous entretenons entre faits tiers de collectivités, tant au niveau national, sous-régional qu'international. Je prends par exemple, je, prends, je donne juste deux exemples. Les relations que nous nous entretenons, l'AMM avec la Fédération canadienne des municipalités et BNG International, sont des coopérations qui, 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 qui échappent au cadre de la diplomatie conventionnelle. Donc, en fait, ce sont des actions de coopération décentralisées mais à un niveau beaucoup plus, à un niveau institutionnel des fêtes des collectivités. Donc, je crois qu'à ce niveau, il faudrait qu'on mène la réflexion comment faire en sorte que ce tasse puisse, puisse être pris en compte dans les relations, dans les actions de coopération au développement qui ne doit plus être des coopérations de territoire à territoire, comme nous avons, de le, nous avons toujours l'habitude de le connaître avec la notion de jumelage coopération. Et mon deuxième, ma deuxième intervention porte sur la situation sécuritaire dans le Sahel qui aura fortement impacté sur les actions de coopération décentralisée. Et déjà avec la Fédération canadienne des municipalités il y a quelques années, c'est le Mali d'abord qui était dans l'œil du cyclone en matière d'insécurité. Et l'alternative que nous avions trouvée avec la Fédération canadienne avec qui nous avions développé un programme pluriannuel, c'était de délocaliser les activités, nos activités au niveau du Burkina Faso. À l'époque, le Burkina n'était pas impacté par une crise. Donc, euh, même les collectivités partenaires du Mali, et de la, les collectivités partenaires du Canada et ceux du Mali se retrouvaient euh, au Burkina Faso autour d'activités euh, communes. Donc, les partenaires canadiens et maliens se retrouvaient au Burkina Faso parce que les Canadiens ne pouvaient plus venir au Mali. Malheureusement, euh, l'insécurité s'est étendue au Burkina. On s'est déplacé en Côte d'Ivoire avec la FCM. Là aussi, il y a eu des inquiétudes. Bref, c'est de, de lancer une réflexion. Comment, euh, comment peut-on continuer, comment trouver des formules, des alternatives à la poursuite des actions de coopération décentralisée dans un contexte de fragilité euh, sécuritaire parce que c'est en ce moment où les collectivités ont le plus besoin de coopération. Tous les, elles sont confrontées à toutes sortes de problèmes, les problèmes humanitaires de populations déplacées, les problèmes d'accès aux services sociaux de base, etc. etc. Et ensuite, je voudrais ajouter à cela quelle approche, quel plaidoyer devrons-nous déployer en direction des grandes agences de coopération, de développement lorsqu'elle décide, en prenant le cas du Mali, lorsqu'elle décide de suspendre les financements, les aides, les activités pour des raisons institutionnelles de politique intérieure ou internationale, comme c'est le cas aujourd'hui entre le Mali avec la FD, le Mali avec la Banque mondiale. Ce qui m'a surpris lorsqu'ils disent, bon, ils vont pas, les actions qu'ils vont entreprendre ne devraient pas impacter les populations. Ils disent qu'ils vont faire intervenir, c'est le cas de la France, ils ont dit, nous allons faire en sorte que les ONG continuent à intervenir. Là, nous, on se dit que, mais quelle, quelle place en ce moment pour les organisations, les fêtes des collectivités, pour les collectivités territoriales? Même si les collectivités territoriales sont des entités de démembrement des États, on peut faire en sorte que les fêtières qu'elles représentent, ou bien les fêtières, les organisations de collectivités qui existent en France, puissent quand même être partie prenante des actions, des appuis aux populations à travers leurs représentants dans nos pays. Je crains que... Tout cela ne soit détourné. Nous avons déjà des difficultés avec certaines ONG euh, en termes d'action sur le territoire des collectivités sans associer celles-ci. Mais si, dans ce contexte de fragilité, les partenaires décident de privilégier les ONG lorsqu'il s'agit de, de réaffecter des fonds, je crois qu'il y a lieu pour CGLU d'entreprendre des actions de plaidoyer à ce niveau, faire en sorte euh, si c'est le Canada, si c'est la France, par exemple, que les États-Unis, France, ou bien l'Association des maires de France, ou bien l'Association des régions de France puissent intervenir, 
si c'est si le Pays-Bas, que ce soit VNG et autres, mais ne pas donner l'exclusivité de euh, des fonds alloués aux ONG. Ensuite, lorsqu'elles disent que ça ne va euh, pas... Monsieur, impact... monsieur euh, Diacté, pardon, est-ce que je peux vous demander de conclure, car nous manquons... Oui, je vais de... conclure. Euh, merci. Euh, je vais conclure en disant que euh, lorsque, par exemple, le cas de la, de la Banque mondiale qui a décidé de suspendre euh, son appui au Mali, mais nous savons qu'il y a au moins 300 collectivités qui bénéficiaient directement euh, des appuis de la Banque mondiale. Maintenant, comment faire en sorte nous menons déjà la réflexion, nous allons mener des actions de lobby de la Sénégal, mais c'est de partager l'information avec vous. Comment faire en sorte que les collectivités, la population ne soient pas directement impactées par le choix politique stratégique des grandes instances avec nos États Du moins, nous, quand même, c'est la diplomatie de proximité, nous ne sommes pas directement impliqués dans ces décisions politiques, mais comment atténuer l'impact de ces décisions sur nos collectivités et nos populations Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur Diakité. On n'a pas assez de temps pour cette très, euh, discussion très intéressante, euh, mais c'est une bonne, euh, euh, bon, bon uh, start. <laughs> um, Est-ce que je peux? Uh, no, I'm, actually, I'm going to ask Sebastian. Can you maybe in one minute, uh, or do you want to react to what's been said in maybe one minute, just briefly on how how this enters into the policy paper. And then I will conclude with uh, a slide with some uh, next steps uh, for everyone. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, everyone, for your comments. And I agree with uh, the comment that uh, Najat, you made right at the start. You know, we should distribute this and get more, gather more and more comments in, in the next few weeks. But just a few, uh, a few reactions. Uh, first of all, on, on this, uh, Najat, this idea of the enabling environment to support DC, and I, I think you gave very, very practical examples of what needs to be in place to support this decentralized cooperation. And certainly, you know, like uh, I will include some of these examples in the, uh, the policy document to highlight, you know, specifically what need, we need to put in place to create that uh, enabling environment. Segla, uh, notre ami du Bénin. Écoutez, je pense que le, le contexte que vous avez expliqué de cette, euh, cette recentralisation euh, est un très bon exemple du besoin de ce premier « call to action », de toujours faire le point et de, faire, de prioriser un dialogue avec les gouvernements centraux et avec des agences d'aide sur le rôle essentiel que jouent les gouvernements locaux. Il n'y aurait pas de coopération décentralisée si les gouvernements locaux ne sont pas reconnus comme étant des acteurs du développement au niveau local. Alors, la recentralisation est un défi, un challenge que l'on vit dans plusieurs pays et ce qui fait en sorte que ce premier « call to action » de continuer à, à reconnaître le rôle des gouvernements locaux est, est très important. Alors, merci beaucoup pour ce point-là. Ce qui m'a fait réfléchir sur le rôle de la coopération décentralisée aussi comme un mécanisme de plaidoyer. Alors, on peut utiliser nos, nos relations entre villes pour ensemble aller voir nos gouvernements centraux et leur dire hey, « Hé, cette recentralisation-là que vous avez fait des, des services en eau en assainissement n'est pas la meilleure façon de donner les services aux citoyens. » Alors, peut-être qu'on peut utiliser aussi nos expériences de coopération décentralisée comme étant des modèles de, de, de plaidoyer. Uh, Charles, um, the role of national association and decentralized cooperation, which is helping to manage that fragmentation that we see from, from time to time. Also, I really like your comment about like a, the, the, the role of the national association to bring a national perspective and to work through these political influence that uh, you know can distort locally sometimes you know the nature of decentralized cooperation i think this is a very important aspect that we need to uh, to mention in the uh, in the document mon ami Youssef du Mali, que je n'avais pas vu depuis plusieurs mois, euh, commentaire sur, oui, le rôle des organisations fêtières qui rejoint un peu les, les commentaires de Charles. Euh, je ne peux qu'être que, que, qu d'accord avec toi, Youssef, sur l'importance de l'AMM pour la coordination, pour structurer la coopération décentralisée dans un pays comme le Mali. J'aime beaucoup le commentaire sur... Ne nous abandonnez pas dans des situations difficiles, dans des situations comme traverse le Mali actuellement, parce que effectivement, la coopération décentralisée, c'est une façon de garder le lien, de garder euh, l'accent le, le, mis sur ces situations-là, d'informer les pays qui coopèrent avec le, le Mali au niveau des populations de ce qui se passe au Mali. Alors absolument, je pense que la coopération décentralisée doit relever ce défi-là de trouver des manières 
de continuer à exister dans des situations qui sont plus difficiles. Et effectivement, le rôle d'association des, des organisations fêtières comme l'AMM est essentiel et l'importance d'avoir une coopération décentralisée entre organisations fêtières est essentielle pour que l'AMM puisse avoir aussi euh, un support d'autres associations dans ces moments-là. Alors, merci beaucoup pour ces commentaires-là, Youssef. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'on va certainement ajouter euh, au, euh, au policy euh, paper. Alors, merci beaucoup pour vos commentaires. Thank you for all your comments. Thank you, uh, Sebastian, for this wrap-up. And uh, thanks to all for, for this short but very uh, fast, uh, well, discussion. It's been very useful. Uh, we, we, we really wanted to, to make this policy paper a lively document, a document owned by everyone. Um, that's and not just a document, not just a document, but a conversation starter for the membership of UCLG, but also for uh, our dialogues with the donor community, with national governments, and with other stakeholders. So this is uh, exactly what we had anticipated, and we hope we can continue such uh, discussions and dialogues in the next years. Um, Some of you already mentioned uh, whether we have more time for consultations and feedback. I, I made a, a slide with, with the timeline. Uh, we are coming to the end of the process, uh, but there is still some time for written feedback. Uh, so we are now this week, we have two more consultations with other uh, regional sections of UCLG and a consultation with the members of DLOG, the network of uh, donors involved in decentral, uh, decentralization and local governance programs. Uh, and after those consultations, so after this week, we then have space for written feedback uh, until the 9th of May. I, I understand that this is not great timing in view of uh, every city so, uh, because it's in the next weeks, but it gives maybe some space to share the presentations and share also the, the draft uh, call to action with your membership. We would be very happy to hear more feedback. I would also like to point out quickly that we have an annual meeting of the CIB Working Group on, eight, on the 8th and 9th of June, and we will continue the discussion on this topic uh, over there in a hybrid session, in fact, but we do hope to see you in Belgium where the meeting is taking place. And then at the UCLG Executive Bureau in June, uh, we will hopefully adopt or have adopted the policy statement by the political uh, well, politicians of UCLG. And then last but not least, in summer, we connect to the broader UCLG policy work and to the other policy councils of UCLG to make sure it doesn't stay in one corner of the organization, but is really well known uh, throughout uh, all, all, of its, all of its bodies. And then at the World Congress in Daejeon in Korea in October, we will officially launch the final paper, which also includes case studies uh, and, and a lot of background information. So that's where we are at. And, and again, we do invite uh, uh, UCLG Africa to share documentation with your members in the next weeks following this uh, timeline, if that's possible. I'm well aware that we are 15 minutes over time and the interpreters said they would have maximum 15 minutes extra. So we are at that moment. So I would like to close here and thank you for your contributions. If you want to continue the conversation, feel free also to send an email or to connect with us bilaterally. I'm going to put my uh, contact details in the chat, um, the CIB email address. Um, And again, I wish you, uh, well, I thank you and I wish you a very nice evening. Uh, goodbye and talk to you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs>